Julian, could you introduce yourself? Thank you, Julian Isaacs. Thank you. That's fun. Well, as you could gather from uh, my accent, I'm uh, not a native of Washington. I'm not a Washingtonian. Uh, I live in the altered state of California and uh, came up here with a great deal of interest and excitement because I think this is a truly historic, it will turn out in retrospect, to have really been a historic uh, com conference with very good speakers. And I want to thank Robert Austin for sponsoring it. I want to explain who I am and therefore what I'm doing here in just a second. But first of all, I'm going to give your right hand some exercise. And the first question I want to ask you, which I would love you to put your hand up if the answer is yes, is does anybody in this room own a sound and light machine? Put your hand up. Aha, thank you very much. <laughs> We're at about 70% or so. Secondly, does anybody in this room think they know, more or less, how sound and light machines work? Put your hand up. Ah, oh, 35%, okay. And fourthly, how many dealers of the Voyager machine do we have here amongst <laughs> us? Okay, thank you. So, so essentially we have a revival meeting here at some <laughs> level. Okay, so do you want me to be the Billy Graham of sound and light? This is the question. I don't think I have the right kind of accent for that, maybe. Let me explain who I am to start off with, and I'll try and make this uh, short and fairly brief. I had intended uh, to talk really about three things. One was about sound and light itself as a modality, its applications, the research that I've done into sound and light. The second is because I'm a professor at John F. Kennedy University's Graduate School of Consciousness Studies, I teach a course on altered states of consciousness. And I think that one of the things that in this industry we should know is some theoretical approaches to consciousness and to the alteration thereof, because we can tend to get lost in our transistors and lose sight of the very important uh, psychological factors. And as I work at Tools for Exploration, our ca catalog is here, and we sell a lot of sound and light machines. I get to field a lot of, lot of requests about sound and light machines I get to see a lot of the new technology that's coming in that we're evaluating to see whether we want to put it in our catalog. And very often the psychological factors, which are really the important ones, get lost underneath the weight of, well, does it take a 9-volt battery or a 6-volt battery? How many functions has it got, etc. So there's issues of what are we doing when we talk about consciousness? What is consciousness? How can we think about consciousness in a way that allows us to understand what we're doing when we try to alter people's states of consciousness and what kinds of applications would they have? And I'm lucky in a sense in going last in the sense that Tom and various other of our speakers have created some form of context in which I can uh, explain. I ought to explain first of all that I started off life intending to do uh, chemistry and geology when I went to university in England. In England, we specialize much more early on than you do in America. We have to prove confidence, uh, competence before we can be creative. In America, you're encouraged to be creative very early on. And this has a lot of advantages, and in some ways, it also has some disadvantages. But in England, we specialize. And so I was going to do hard science and I went to university and wound up doing my first degree in philosophy and history. And as a philosopher, I was fascinated in the, uh, by the issue of consciousness. How could it be that this piece of meat could be conscious? How could this physical structure have consciousness? And that question, in some ways, has propelled me through the, my career for the rest of my life. You may think that you're dealing in weird stuff in dealing with these consciousness altering, uh, altering technologies. And indeed we are. We are on the cutting edge. But I want to point out that the cutting edge that we occupy is within an arena of a much bigger possible worldview. A worldview which includes an understanding, for example, of some of the reasons for the spiritual and religious practices of the past some of the world views which are embodied within those viewpoints and some of the practices which are designed to allow people to experience those worlds. Because the thing about consciousness is that consciousness is reflective of reality and reality is reflective of consciousness. We have our consciousness shaped by our realities. 
It, Tom was talking about the effect of early childhood trauma upon the consciousness of the individual who received that kind of family background. So the reality shapes our consciousness. But then, alas, alas for us in America, we then project that reality outside into the world and we project our consciousness into the world in the sense that what we can perceive, hear, and see is filtered through our systems of understanding, which are, in fact, our consciousness. So in other words, there's a reciprocal relationship between consciousness and reality, and, for example, saints, gurus, and enlightened beings live literally in a different world from the world in which we live. So what we're talking about in terms of why we should want to transform our consciousness is that in some sense we want to transform the lived world in which we live. And this is something which I don't want us to lose in amongst the technicalities of, well, it's an alpha wave or a beta wave, etc. Because one of the problems we run into is the reductivist, uh, reductivist denial that if we can characterize something adequately in quantitative terms, we've left out the meaning. And we talk about, well, we don't want to follow the old primitive ways, but the issue about primitive ways was that they retained meaning. And one of the problems of our technology is that if our technology is developed first using hardware, which it tends to be, and we focus on hardware, on all the creativity is on hardware, we get wonderful hardware, but we have no more meaning. A wonderful example of that is the number of people who are depressed in America, even though we have m more IBM compatibles than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> we have the best technology, and we can wage war on other nations whenever we feel like it, very efficiently. But unfortunately, when we come back in, our cities are burning, our children are uh, uneducated, and we, ha we can't afford health insurance. So the points that I'm making is we're operating in a broader social context in which this con consciousness transformation technology is taking place. And if we look at the historical roots of that uh, transformational technology, it originated in the vision of the 60s, the acid delirium, whereby the world was seen as a world in which we could be enlightened, in which things could be fair and okay. We were going to protest. We were dumb. We were students. We didn't know that that would make no difference. But what it did do was to change the culture. And if you wanted to, you could create a myth where that generation grows up. It becomes physiologically incapable of ingesting the substances to bring about those, those particular states. And therefore, it uses Silicon Valley to purchase those states with their yuppie incomes in a very handy-dandy, detachable, portable fashion. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that that analysis is wholly true. I'm parodying it, really, to wake you up a bit because you've had a hell of a day, and so have I, even though it's been <laughs> very entertaining and interesting. I want to lay my claim to weird stuff because consciousness is weird. Consciousness does take us into realms where we would never go other than through consciousness. And Stephen LeBurge's uh, wonderful development of the technology of lucid dreaming illustrates that even more powerfully. We can be supermen and superwomen in our dreams. Let's hope that we can also become those super people in real life. And that's one of the promises that are made by our technologies. One of the things that I want to underscore, because I think it's going to come up in our discussion afterwards, is that our technology is making promises which are very, very, very slightly supported by a very small amount of research. I am an experimental psychologist, and as such, I have a skeptical and humble disposition because I am very aware of the incredible limitations on what we know. But what we know about psychotechnology is very small compared to what we know about anything else in psychology, partly because it's so new, but also because it is not academically respectable. What's happened is we've grown an industry and a craft and an art before we've grown a science. And that has some very powerful implications for what we should do so we're not cut off at the roots. And I don't want to be a doom and gloom merchant because I don't think that doom and gloom is either accurate or appropriate for our enterprise. I think that our attitude should be one of forging forward. But in the knowledge that there's an awful lot of research to do that we need to do that hasn't been done. And books such as Megabrain, which are wonderful. As, who's read Megabrain in this room? Thank you. Your, our Bible group definitely looking up. <laughs> that 
Megabrain is the Bible of the psychotechnological movement, but in Megabrain, there is not too much distinction between research which was really carefully done double blind and somebody sitting in their back uh, yard garage doing interesting stuff where he had a pal and this or that happened. And in fact, what we find is that there is a huge amount of non-double blind, non-refereed research in the field, which is very pilot research. I find this frustrating because it's clear that the field has immense potential and it's immensely important and indeed the consciousness revolution will happen through psychotechnology in a way that it cannot happen by the liberal and free use of psychedelics because I guess it gets too dangerous on the roads or we get too old to be able to use it or we don't have the social containers and contexts and spiritual disciplines to be able to use those kinds of substances too safely in our society. Maybe things will change. So let's, let's, get, let's cut the cackle and get down to some of the beef here. I, I studied something which is extraordinarily difficult for human beings to do and which is in some ways weirder than altered states. I was a parapsychologist and my specialist area of interest was in training psychokinetic ability using instrumented systems to receive the psychokinetic effects of other people. And that taught me that Boy, you think it's hard to get into alpha? Try and get somebody to bend a spoon without touching it. <laughs> I succeeded in both, and what fascinated me was that the most effective uh, people in this arena were the individuals with the greatest experience of mental skills, of peak performance training, of attitudinal management, of essentially internal psychotechnology. And that was a little bit before our wonderful devices became available. Now I teach and I'm the, uh, at John F. Kennedy University and I'm director of research for Tools for Exploration. Before I did that, I worked in a very fascinating project which was designed to produce a form of twilight training. And the issue that I was given to solve was how do you get people into theta? And I think I've probably spent more hours, get well, not more hours than Tom may be, but pretty well similar hours to Tom getting people into theta. And we use sound and light devices, we use tapes, we use Gunsfeld techniques, we use all sorts of different techniques, and, f and we also used a 24-channel uh, brain mapper, the, the identical machine to Tom's machine, and we produced similar kinds of uh, pictures and photographs there. Unfortunately, because I was only asked to talk two days ago, my visual aids are limited to these, so I intend to try and use them as much as possible. What we found was that despite what some of the manufacturers of sound and light machines had said, sound and light machines do not seem to drive brain waves very well in the theta domain. If you look at an EEG and you start the sound and light machine in the high range, up around 30 cycles or 25, you, sh you can look at the spectral output from the EEG and clearly the person is producing the same output that the machine is giving them. In other words, 25 cycles in, 25 cycles out. That's very clear. That continues right down through from beta into the alpha range. And then at some point, really depending upon the individual and probably also depending upon the day, the mood and a number of other factors, you find that the EEG driving splits, it stops. The person usually reaches this kind of crash barrier at eight cycles or thereabouts. What then happens is something that is absolutely universal within the straight street, uh, normal psychophysiological uh, literature produced from universities, W. Gray Walters and other people's research into the use of photic driving. And there is a huge literature on Flickr. There's a lot of stuff already performed on Flickr well before the advent of sound and light machines. We were not the first people into this territory. And what they found was that below the alpha cutoff frequency, you get a doubling phenomenon. And in their EEGs, they even found a tripling. That is, if you put six cycles in, you get 12 out plus 18. And with my EEG, it was good enough for us to see 24. So what you get is a series of six cycle harmonics coming out of the brain if you put six cycles in. You don't get any six cycles that, it, that is very pronounced at all. 